I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet. At the midnight cry, we'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall That remain, they will be quickly changed at the midnight cry when Jesus comes again. around me I see prophecies fulfilling and signs of the times they're appearing everywhere I can almost hear the fathers he says son Go get your children And at the midnight cry The bride of Christ shall rise When Jesus stepped out On a cloud to call his children The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the And then those that remain, they will be quickly changed at the midnight cry. And then, those are the things that will be quickly changed at the midnight cross when Jesus comes again at the midnight cross. Hello everybody and welcome to this, the September edition of The Midnight Cry. And this is Lindsay Griffiths welcoming you. This is a wonderful song that we begin with, also the title of the program, The Midnight Cry. It's talking about the very, very, very close days when Jesus is coming back again. 
And I want you to think about this today. So many people right now are really caught up, whether they're Christian believers or whether they're not. So many people believe that these are strange times we're living in when prophecies are being fulfilled. Our number one authority for that is the Word of God, the Bible. But so many are beginning to wake up to the signs of the times. And sometimes, unfortunately, in the church, the body of Christ on earth, many, like the foolish virgins, are asleep and they don't know. So this program is all about the signs of the times and waking up to what the Word of God is really saying. Okay, so tonight, and in fact, I think last month I did as well look at the book of Genesis, or recently, and creation. But I want to look at something different now. Most people who know even a bit their Bible, they know about Adam and Eve. They know how they were, because of sin, thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And they know that they have two sons, or had, I'm sorry, two sons, Cain and Abel. And they know, a lot of people know, that sin was lurking at the door of Abel's, sorry, of Cain's heart. And that he murdered out of jealousy and anger his own brother. But how many people know that Adam and Eve later on, had another son who was the founder of a godly line, ending up with Noah and his children. And this son was called Seth. And Seth means, in Hebrew, the appointed one, the one who has been put in place. So God's plan was that they should have this other son called Seth. And we read about him in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 25 on. And to Seth, he was, I said he was the founder of a very godly family. And let's have a look at one or two of them. There was, eventually, a few generations later, a man called Jared, a descendant of Seth. I said it was a godly line. And Seth begat a son called Enoch. And all the days of Jared, it says, because they lived to a very old age in these days, were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 50, six, sorry, 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And by the way, <laughs> Some of you might have heard an old song which said about Methuselah lived 900 years. And it was actually Methuselah who was uh, the oldest person recorded in the Bible. So he's famous because he lived a massively huge number of years. But very more important is Enoch, who was, yeah, the father of Methuselah. And all the days of Enoch, it says, that's in Genesis 5, verse 23, were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. And later on, we see a couple of generations later, Lamech begets, begat, <laughs> begat Noah. Anyway, What's amazing about Enoch, if you look at it, God loved Enoch so much that he took him up to heaven. There are not many cases of that in the Bible, not with no ordinary human beings. Obviously, the Lord Jesus, when he uh, died for us on the cross and rose again the third day, and then his father, God himself, took him up to heaven. The ascension, we'd call it and left the Holy Spirit on earth. But for an ordinary person, apparently ordinary person, like Enoch, God really loved him, and he took him up like a sort of a mini rapture, if you like. He took him up to heaven. And the only other one, unless you're very brilliant and know other things I know, I think the only other one was Elijah, the great prophet Elijah, who had a chariot of fire that came and took him up to heaven. 
<laughs> Wonderful stuff. Now, you see, what has this got to do with the end times? A lot, a lot. I want you to come with me, and I'm going to go back to Genesis in a minute, but I want you to come with me to the book of Jude, the letter of Jude. A short letter, but full of punch. Amazing stuff. And so I love the book of Jude. Because it's got so many warnings about the end times. And this is really strange because we read about Enoch as the seventh from Adam. All those years before, thousands of years before the book of Jude was written, right? Enoch is mentioned um, as prophesying about the second coming of Jesus. How remarkable is that? No wonder God loved him so much. What an amazing revelation to have. You know, just not long, so very long after the creation and Adam and Eve themselves, his ancestors. So I just want to show you it here to show the remarkable way that God works. I'm just trying to, ah, yes. Jude 14 says, verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, so seven generations from Adam, six generations from Adam's godly son, Seth, prophesied of these, that's these evil people and wicked, wicked men who would come in these end times. He prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh, with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince, that means to convict, all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. Look at that. Three times he says ungodly. And of all these hard speeches which ungodly sinners, the fourth ungodly, have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And he said, and, and Jude himself warns about these mockers in the last days, and how we, those of us who are believers, should it said, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. And he says in the very last two verses, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. So isn't that remarkable that way back in the very early days after the garden, after the creation, really quite early on, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, actually prophesied about the coming Jesus coming again to judge. And so who else is famous? Enoch and Noah. And God recognized Noah and his family. And there's a great song about this that was sung. I know that my husband Dave sang this in Sunday school in the mission hall. Where he, here he was. And it's a really great song. And it goes on about Mr. Noah built an ark. And the chorus, I think, goes, And the rain came down in torrents. The rain came down in torrents. The rain came down in torrents. And only eight were saved because the world was so wicked at this time. God had absolutely had enough. Eight people, that was all that were saved out of the whole world. And again, Noah was a descendant down the godly line of Seth down the, after the great prophet and godly man Enoch, who God took, and Methuselah, who was the oldest man who ever lived, according to the Bible. And uh, there he was, Noah, his wife, that's two of them, their sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. So that's six plus two, eight, right? But of course, all the birds and animals had two of every kind in the ark as well. 
Isn't that great? And God made the first ever covenant with Noah after the floods subsided. Only those eight were saved, plus the birds and animals and creeping things. So God spoke unto Noah, saying, this is now Genesis chapter 8, verse 15, saying, go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply. Notice that word. He says it for the animals and also to Noah. So Noah, giving thanks to God for having lived through the flood and being in this wonderful ark, and God had given him the exact designs and measurements for making this wonderful boat. Noah built an uh, altar unto the Lord. That's Genesis 8, verse 20. And took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Isn't this a wonderful verse, 22, verse 22? And it's um, talked about as one of the great hymn about God called Great is Thy Faithfulness. It says, while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And later on in chapter 9, he says he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. So whatever happens in the end times, when there's a new heaven and a new earth talked about in Revelation, it will not be destroyed by a flood. We know that. You see? And he talks about the seed time and harvest, day and night, hot and cold remaining. And then he makes a covenant with Noah. A wonderful covenant. A very, very, very early covenant in the word of God because he makes other covenants, as we know, of course. For example, with Abraham. So this is now reading Genesis 9, verse 8. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark, to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said... This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy the earth. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every creature of all flesh, that is on the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is now Genesis 9 verse 17, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Isn't that beautiful? You see the rainbow is a holy covenant from God. The rainbow is not to be used for other 
purposes and adopted. And I'm not talking here, don't get me wrong, about anybody in particular. I'm talking about the flags with rainbows on them. We must know this is a holy covenant that was made between God and Noah. Nobody had ever seen a rainbow before, ever, on the earth. And in fact, nobody had seen an ark before or anything that floated on the earth. It was just the most wonderful, wonderful story. And God, this is what the word of God is all about, being fruitful and multiplying. Both the fruit of the earth, corn and other crops, fruit and vegetables, trees, all these things. It's all about fruit. Seed time and harvest he talks about. All about fruit. He wants us to bear fruit, both physically in the form of marriage and children. Marriage and children. He wants the animals to bear fruit as well, to have their young, to reproduce. This is what the whole of the Bible is based on, sowing and reaping. Spiritually, especially in the New Testament, the New Covenant, we read in John chapter 15, I am the vine, ye are the branches. You know, and we read about all of this, and he says in chapter 15, My Father is glorified that ye bear much fruit. Be fruitful and multiply, not only physically. That is why we should not ever, ever kill and destroy our own fruit. The fruit of the womb. That is just completely against God's plan. Apart from the fact he says thou shalt not kill. This is our future. Children are the reward of the Lord. Read Psalm 127 and 128 about this. Children are the reward from God. But also we should be fruitful. Even more important, spiritually those of us who are believers, that is what God wants. He wants a beautiful earth bearing fruit. And he is the creator. Let's never worship the creation, but only the creator. Glory to God that he created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1. And that it's true. The word of God is true in Genesis right through to Revelation. Let's not forget this. And it says Jesus is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, folks. Before God had this plan from before the foundation of the earth to send his son Jesus as the spotless Lamb of God, the second Adam. As in Adam, that's Adam and Eve we're talking about here, all die. They did, because they brought sin and death on the earth by listening to the words of the serpent and eating of the forbidden tree, the fruit of the forbidden tree. As in Adam all die, so in the second Adam, Christ Jesus, all shall be made alive. It's all about life and bearing fruit and replenishing the earth. And don't forget the rainbow, but above all, the cross at which the spotless Lamb of God shed his blood, Jesus, which is forever, ever, never loses its power. And that's why, in the words of the closing song, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary.
I believe that this life with its great mysteries surely someday must come to its end. Oh, but faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to my throne I believe that the Christ who was slain on the cross has the power to change lives today. For he changed me completely. A new life is mine. That is why by the cross I will stay. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. Thank you for listening, dear brothers and sisters. And we love being with you tonight and sharing with you this program, the songs, the music, and the word of God, the midnight cry. And looking forward to being with you next month for the next edition of this program. So take care. God bless you. Bye for now. Bye for now.
Jesus comes again.